welcome everyone to this Positive Money Europe webinar on climate inflation and the future of monetary policy. My name is David Barnes. I'm head of research at Positive Money UK, and I'll be moderating this discussion today, where we'll hear from an outstanding panel of speakers who I will introduce in a moment. Uh, first, a few words about Positive Money. We're a nonprofit research and campaign organization working towards a money and banking system that enables a fair, sustainable and democratic economy. We have a team in Brussels, which organized this webinar, a team in London, where I'm based, and we also recently set up in the US. Monetary policy is a central element of our work, and we're very interested in how it can affect and can be affected by climate change and other environmental pressures. So this brings us to the topic of today's discussion, uh, climate inflation and the future of monetary policy. The term climate inflation was coined by European Central Bank Executive Board member Isabella Schnabel in a speech last year, in which she defined climate inflation as an inflationary shock linked to the costs of climate change. Schnabel explains that as the number of natural disasters and severe weather events is rising, so is their impact on economic activity and prices. So this is a phenomenon that is already very real and is likely to grow in importance and relevance to households and to the implementation of monetary policy. So we have four speakers today who are very well placed to dive deeper into this subject. First, we have uh, Donata Faccia, who is a senior economist in the European Central Bank's representative office in Brussels. Uh, Donata, Donata has worked as an economist both in the Monetary Analysis Division and in the European Institutions Fora Division. We also have Osman Ouattara, who is a development economist for the Global Development Institute at the University of Manchester. We have Pietro Cova, who is a senior economist at the Bank of Italy, where he works in the econom Econometric Analysis and Macroeconomic Forecasts Division of the Economic Outlook and Monetary Policy Department. And we have Maria Nicolaidi, who is an associate professor in economics at the University of Greenwich and a fellow at the Forum for Macroeconomics and Macroeconomic Policies. And Maria is also a positive money advisor for which we are very grateful. Um, so we're going to have two rounds of contributions today from our speakers, followed by a Q&A with the audience. So anyone listening in can ask their questions in the Q&A box. Um, so with that, let's get started with our first round where we'll focus on how climate change affects inflation and how it plays out in different contexts. So we'll first go to uh, Pietro, starting with a theoretical perspective. Um, as a macro modeler, Pietro, how do you think about the macroeconomic effect of climate change, in particular when it comes to inflation? First of all, uh, thank you for this opportunity and the invitation. And as usual, uh, you know, I'm from a central bank, so the usual disclaimer holds. Uh, everything that I say, of course, is my personal view. Uh, so going uh, specifically to your question, let me first give you a, a, a quick answer and then I will try to go more into the detail. So the quick answer is that climate change at first sight is like a, an ordinary supply shock. So as any supply shock, is, it has uh, stagflationary implications, meaning uh, lower, uh, lowering inflation or even deflation and uh, a reduction in output. But as a... <clears throat> uh, research shows uh, it has also impacts on, on demand conditions and it seems from uh, the research that uh, we can uh, consult that uh, it affects demand via various channels which interact with each other and which even feedback on the supply side and of course these demand effects are mostly non-inflationary or even deflationary in some cases I will go then deeper into the details uh, and it seems even that these demand effects could even swamp to the inflationary effects, even in the short run. Okay, there is some evidence on this. So the, the quick answer to your question is that uh, uh, 
the, the inflationary impacts of climate change are not unequivocal, so it is not easy. It is not a, a one-shot answer. In, in the very short run, most likely they are inflationary, and Donata has a, a nice uh, research paper on this issue showing this uh, very clearly. But over medium to longer run horizons, they tend to become deflationary. So now, now let me uh, give you some, some, some examples, some, some more details. I, I, I have then some notes that I'm willing to share if you want, where I have all the, the references that I, that I used uh, to, to, to inform myself, basically. So uh, let's start by saying that, 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 as I said, that the linkages between climate and the economy in general are complex, they are evolving, and they are very uncertain in their dimensions. Of course, if we, if we think in terms of physical climate risks, then um, flooding, droughts, heat waves, and so forth, they, they determine uh, destruction of capital, they can lower uh, labor productivity, they can create, of course, debt, social unrest. Uh, but of course, the extent and the likelihood of these events uh, is very difficult to predict. As I said, at first sight, this is a, a negative supply shock, and, and, and as such, it has uh, stagflationary implications, meaning for inflation, uh, a reduction or even uh, deflationary impacts. But there is compelling evidence that the demand side effects are very strong, and they can be both direct demand effects or indirect and, and indirect ones. Let, let's let's distinguish between the two. The direct demand effect is, for example, if we have an energy shortage, which uh, or um, a climatic event which determines uh, an energy shortage or an increase in prices. Of course, this will have negative effects on uh, disposable disposable incomes and profits. Of course, and this is a negative demand shock. But there are also indirect effects, general equilibrium effects which are mainly through wages and employment. And these effects are very uh, heterogeneous. So they affect more lower income profiles, of course, because uh, people at the lower end of the income distribution rely more on their, solely on their income to shield themselves from, uh, uh, for example, an increase in, uh, in, uh, in energy prices and fossil fuel prices more in general. And of course, so they have more impact on, on, on this type of uh, households than, of course, on those households which also have uh, uh, savings that uh, help them to smooth the impact of the shock. And there is evidence that these indirect demand effects are very strong. For example, in a recent study uh, by Ken Zick, he shows that about 80% of the whole impact on the macroeconomy comes from this indirect demand effect. And, 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 and as such, what I was saying at the beginning, the overall effect could even be non-inflationary or even deflationary, also in the short run, because of this demand side effect. Now, being even more, uh, a little bit more, um, uh, going more into detail, of course, if, if we think about these climate changes, uh, the first thing that, at least to, to, to me, my first thought is that these are very uncertain events, okay? So it, it creates uncertainty. And even in this case, uncertainty has an impact on, on your decision on firms and households' decision more in general. So there is also evidence that uh, this increased, uh, for example, temperature volatility by itself has negative impacts on growth and inflation. Why? Well, because, uh, uh, of course, the more you are exposed to an uncertain environment, the more you will take actions. And in terms of a consumer, the actions that you take, of course, is that you uh, tend to be very cautious. So you increase your savings, for example, because something's real, something really bad related to a climatic event can happen. And in, firms, or in terms of firms, you postpone your investment decisions or even you relocate them because you think that uh, maybe you are located in an area which is not safe enough. So there is evidence. And it's also these effects, of course, this, the effects linked to uh, increased volatility, for example, in temperature, has a deflationary uh, impact. Uh, and here I'm citing results from a study by a colleague with uh, with, a, uh, with an English economist, econometrician, uh, Muntas, Alexander Muntas. In general, I think that when we think about climate changes 
and we want to assess whether they have inflationary or non-inflationary impact, it's important to, to, to think about expectations, as I was saying. More in general, one can also think about um, households being more and less forward-looking. And, and here again, depending on whether you, you think that these events will affect your disposable income in the in the distant future or in the more uh, immediate, uh, let's say, future, you, you will take uh, decisions which will affect the demand side of the economy. And of course, they will affect the demand side negatively. Uh, and then there is also the international dimension, which I did not mention. But again, here also, uh, the, the thing about uh, climatic change is that it's it's not specifically of one country. Usually, it can also affect more countries at the same time, or it can also be specific to one country, but then have repercussions on another country. So, for example, there is evidence that it is uh, that uh, climatic changes can affect uh, capital flows. Why? Because of course, if you are a portfolio investor, uh, your concern would be probably to move your investments, maybe from a country which is highly exposed to one of these uh, events to another country. And here again, there is evidence that this is exactly what is happening, especially uh, in emerging economies, which are more exposed to, to, to strong climatic events, that uh, portfolio shifts then from these countries to maybe safer countries most likely advanced economies. And in this case, you can then argue that the effect might be inflationary for the country that is experiencing, experiencing the redirection in these investment flows. And of course, deflationary in the country which sees a reduction in, 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 in investment flows. So there are these push and pull factors which are also uh, very relevant. Uh, there is then uh, the whole issue that you raise in your nice blog on uh, climate inflation about shifts in economic activity. No? You argue there uh, in, in your blog, which I encourage everyone here to, to read because it's really up to date and well done, <coughs> that the inflationary, there, <coughs> there can be <coughs> inflationary effects, for example, for food prices because of uh, an event which negatively affects <coughs> Uh, temperatures, but at the same time, you find you, you cite evidence where uh, there is a, a decrease in consumer prices, excluding the electricity, electricity sector, due to lower industrial production. Uh, and then, of course, there are there is also the issue of financial stability. So when we think about uh, climatic uh, changes, we 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 also think that this can create financial instability. Okay, and this financial instability acts like a uh, credit market tightening and it's deflationary. What do I have in mind? For example, think about events that uh, disrupt the value <coughs> of properties. Okay, so this will clearly have an impact on the loans issued towards uh, persons who want to buy or purchase a house. So, of course, it, it will have negative impact if we think that this. Uh, houses are more exposed to some event and this can have negative effects on <clears throat> on an important sector of an economy or uh, there is also uh, evidence in italy for example that uh, uh, firms um, sorry um, uh, firms yeah firms more exposed to flood risk they tend to receive less loans from the, the banking system so this is also another example of a uh, financial instability induced by uh, climate uh, changes. And then, of course, I think we will speak about it. There is the whole issue with monetary policy. So again, one, one piece of evidence, uh, which I think is, is quite relevant for, for us central bankers, is what happens to the natural interest rate. So the interest rate, which in theory should um, yield an equilibrium between saving and investment, which should be the target, say, of, of the interest rate uh, uh, targeted by the central, used by the central bank as an instrument for targeting its uh, primary objective of inflation, for example. And again, here uh, there is some evidence that, for example, disaster risk ex ante, ex ante. So if you know that you are in a country exposed to uh, recurrent uh, climatic events which are negative. This acts like a negative demand, again, through expectations. So it lowers the natural interest rate, it lowers inflation, and this poses then a challenge for the central bank 
because of course you have less monetary space uh, uh, if you need to, to, to lower uh, the interest rate. But more in general, and I'm, I'm concluding, for monetary policy, of course, it becomes uh, more and more challenging, let's say, to um, how can I say to, to assess the proper policy stance because the more you are exposed in an to an uncertain environment due to climate change, the more you will probably have difficulties in assessing properly the policy stance. Uh, the more this could lead to higher volatility and to disanchoring of inflation expectations. And as uh, a recent uh, speech Isabel Schnabel said. This can have then also can lead then to persistent inflationary effects if uh, you know the the, the disanchoring of the inflation expectation is left uh, unchecked. So let me uh, just conclude and then give the word to the other panelists. Uh, summing up, climate ch climate change is uh, the, at first sight a supply shock, and as such, it has theoretically stagflationary effects. But as I tried to uh, convince you. It has at the same time also um, uh, impact on the demand side of the economy. This, this demand side uh, effects are interconnected. They also feed back if we think on the supply side, because if you have a destruction, for example, of capital, this means lower investment. Lower investment has then, of course, reduces also the potential in the longer run. So it feeds back on the supply side. But uh, more in general, I think that. Um, that uh, we can say that in the very short run, the effects are inflationary, but then in the medium and longer run, the, the, the demand side effects tend to dominate and uh, the effects are non-inflationary or even uh, deflationary. Okay, this is uh, as such, and I, I think, and then we will go into the second question, but later it is important to have access to a broad set of data sources and models in order to capture this this uh, this multiple chance. Thank you. Great, thank you, Pietro. Um, yeah, thank you for outlining, um, uh, getting to I think some of the really big questions in this discussion, and it's really the crux of the concept of climate inflation and uh, looking at both the supply side and the demand side effects over the short and then medium to long term. Um, so, and thank you also for mentioning Positive Money Europe's blog on this subject. We can possibly share that around to participants and as well as other resources in the aftermath. So let's let's move to Donata um, to, to go a bit further into some of the empirical findings in the literature. From your perspective, Donata, can the impact of climate change on inflation be es estimated uh, and, and what has, the literature on this found so far. Yes, hello, hello everyone. And let me also say that I'm very happy to be here today uh, as this is a topic that is very close to my heart. Um, as the next slides uh, uh, points out, like, like Pietro said, uh, the usual disclaimer applies. So I don't know if you can show the next slide. Uh, I'm here today in, uh, in my personal capacity. And so the views I would express today are my own and do not necessarily reflect those of the ECB or of the ESCB. Next slide. So coming back to your question on whether we can estimate the impact of climate change on inflation, I would like to take a step back uh, and make sure we are all on the same page. So um, as, um, as you said at the beginning, uh, there are generally three channels through which climate change uh, can impact prices. And I think these channels have been very well summarized by, by Isabel Schnabel. The first channel, which is climate inflation, basically looks at how natural disasters and severe climatic events in general affect economic activity and prices. The second channel, which is uh, called also greenflation, looks at how the shift towards the uh, green transition is affecting prices. As we know, um, a lot of technologies uh, related to the green transition rely on uh, specific critical raw materials, and this leads uh, to a significant increase of demand for these materials. While at the same time, the supply of this material is constrained, especially in the short to the medium term. So basically, we know that, for example, to open a mine, it takes five to 10 years. And this mismatch between, let's say, on one on the one hand demand and on the other hand supply uh, may affect prices. And then the third 
manner for which climate change uh, can affect uh, prices is the so-called fossil inflation, which basically relates to the, the let's say, the increase uh, in a fossil fuel energy coming from the fight uh, um, against climate change, whereby basically we make more visible in the price of fossil fuel their environmental damage. Now, today, uh, I, in, in, my, in my intervention, I will basically refer to the first channel, which is climate inflation. So I will not talk about, for example, transition policies. Next slide. So now that we have all clear what climate inflation is and what is not, let's go back to, to your question, which is whether we can estimate the impact of climate change on inflation. And to be short, I think my answer, my short answer, it's yes, it's possible. But there are a lot of caveats. Uh, first of all, it's not so straightforward to assess the impact of climate change on inflation because we have a lot of data availability issues. Uh, I, I think also uh, Pietro referred to that before. Um, I, I see that we are making progress uh, on this. For example, when I started to look um, to work a bit in this field, I think back in 2019, uh, I was struggling to find the right data, but now I see we, we have more uh, access to, to relevant data in this respect. So there is still a gap to perhaps to fill, but um, we are making progress, which is good news. The second reason why it's not so easy, in my view, to, have, to estimate the impact of climate change on inflation is that you need to look You need to have, let's say, an interdisciplinary approach, um, and this may complicate a bit your research because perhaps you, you know, for example, I don't know, as an economist, you don't know what is a, a good journal in another, in another, in another field, no? Uh, and so, for example, here, if I think a bit about my research, um, you know, I encounter this problem of the elusive concept of absolute temperature. Basically, scientists say it's impossible to to estimate absolute temperature, so you need to look at deviations of temperature. And these, and these are all, all, all things that we need to keep in mind when we try to assess the impact of climate change. And finally, um, also there is the issue that the past is ne not necessarily a good predictor of the future because climate change is evolving and we can expect a much higher impact uh, going forward in the future. So it's not that if we don't see an impact today, we may not see an impact tomorrow. So then at the point you need to go into forecasting and there is a lot, a lot of uncertainty. Um, and then again, and maybe another, another method that complicates a bit. The thing is that this is kind of a new field. So we are still a lot to learn. Um, and so we have to be ready to make a lot of mistakes uh, because, because we, we, still, we still don't know a lot of things. Uh, for example, uh, if I think if I think about um, a bit now the economic literature in the field of climate change, I would say that until a few years ago, the literature mainly focused on the impact of natural disasters, for example, in emerging market economies on economic activity, but there was almost nothing on the impact of, of climate change and inflation. So, for example, when I start to look into this topic, I remember I could barely rely on two reliable uh, research papers, one looking at uh, uh, the inflationary impact of hurricanes in the Caribbean, and then another, another work from, uh, from uh, a colleague here at the ECB. So uh, let's go now to the next slide. So now, now that we have a bit in mind uh, what are the challenges, maybe I can say a few words on what I found in my research and what I think are the key takeaways for, for researchers who want to venture in this field. So in terms of what I found, well, in this, in this work uh, that I did with two ECB colleagues, uh, Livio Strack and Miles Parker, we look basically at the effect that extreme temperatures um, assess in terms of deviation from, let's say, um, baseline temperatures in a country affect price stability. Um, and here we, we have plotted our results, uh, distinguishing between advanced and emerging economies. What we have found is that, um, let's say, in the short term, um, um, extreme temperatures affect mainly food prices and mainly in, uh, in emerging market economies, although it's not so visible here. 
here, but there is also a small impact um, at T0 also in, in advanced economies. Uh, and that this, uh, let's say, impact is also visible overall in headline inflation in emerging market economies, because these economies um, basically have a higher reliance of food in their in their consumption basket and also probably a less exposed to international food markets. So let's say the impact of domestic shock uh, on uh, on uh, CPI food is uh, and CPI in general is higher. Uh, but then when we move over the medium term, uh, we started to see uh, some deflationary impact uh, in emerging market economies uh, in the medium term, which is the horizon where uh, central banks need to focus. Um, and so I think this, this uh, let's say, is in line with what Pietro mentioned before. Um, this, however, does not mean that advanced, uh, advanced economies, central banks, should uh, should be calm because, as I said before, uh, climatic disasters are becoming bigger insights and more frequent. So it's very difficult to say that will we, we will be spared by this in the future. Let me now move to my last slide um, here with, uh, I think, some uh, key takeaways from my research on climate inflation that I hope can help others who want to venture in this field. First of all, I think it's really important to um, look at, at different, uh, for example, quarters in a separate manner because the timing matters. For example, if when we start to look at the impact of uh, um, extreme temperatures on an annual basis, we did not find any impact. But then when we broke down um, by seasons our research, then we started to see a, a large and longer lasting impact from uh, uh, hot summers. The second important takeaway is that it's important to look at uh, a different range of uh, price indexes because as I showed, for example, the impact is not the same across different sectors. Um, third, it's also important to look at different time horizons. So you have to focus both to, in the, to the short term and on the, on the medium term uh, because the impact may have a different sign, but also because, of course, from a central banking point of view, it is important to distinguish between short term, short lived events and medium term impacts so more long lasting. Uh, finally, you have also to look at the impact of adaptation policies. And here uh, a bit, I think you should not be surprised in case you don't find a, a good impact, a good effect of adaptation of poli uh, policies. Because for example, in our case, we, yeah, maybe that's a bit of a pessimistic note, no? Our results were unchanged when we accounted for adaptation policies. And finally, and also really important is that the impact is non-linear so it is higher at uh, um, larger at higher absolute temperatures and also um, depending on the sites of the temperature shocks so you need to look at, at different type of shocks for example so this this i think are are, are the takeaways in case in case someone uh, want, wants to venture uh, in this field thank you great thank you very much donata and i think that's uh, another piece of work that we'll have to share with participants uh, after the session. So we'll now move uh, from the central bankers to the academics on the panel, uh, starting with Osman. In your work on natural disasters in low-income economies, how do you find that climate change impacts inflation? Does this differ from higher income economies? And if so, uh, what do you think explains such differences? Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, David. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, inviting me here uh, uh, today. And uh, thank you for the two presenters who have uh, kind of covered uh, uh, some aspect of the work that uh, I am doing. But one thing that uh, I will start by saying is that uh, we probably need to make a difference between uh, um, the effect of natural disaster and the effect of uh, climate. Uh, for the simple reason that uh, a natural disaster, as uh, Pietro uh, had said, are unpredictable event which occur. And in general, once the recovery uh, has uh, taken place, this effect will disappear. So you'll tend to see that uh, natural disaster studies that look at the, uh, the impact on inflation will find a short-term effect, okay? But climate change um, is a, a totally a different. It's a kind of a long-term effect. So it's quite important, in my view, to make uh, a, this distinction. So uh, to come to our paper, 
and where uh, we look at the impact of uh, climate climate change on inflation, uh, what we find in general is that uh, uh, for developed countries, okay, the impact seems to be a short term, as uh, Pietro has just said. So after one year, uh, the significant effect uh, disappear. But when we look at uh, the context of uh, uh, developing countries, the effect was actually uh, persistent over longer term, five to six years, seven years in, uh, uh, in, in some cases. Without actually going into detail and to try to find out what is happening, one of the arguments that we use in the paper is probably because uh, in developing country, there is a large agricultural sector. And one of the reasons could be because of food prices that uh, uh, the effect remain persistent. And interestingly enough, um, kind of, kind of uh, working on a paper on a specific country, but I don't want to say that here because uh, the central bank of that country is uh, <laughs> involved in the research. What we find is actually a food inflation, which is uh, a driving, uh, a, 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 which is the channel through which climate change actually affect uh, a headline uh, inflation. So to kind of sum up, for developed countries, based on our studies, the impact of climate change is short term, consistent with uh, the theoretical overview that uh, Pietro uh, gave earlier. But for developing countries, the effect is uh, uh, persistent, probably because of uh, uh, reliance on uh, the agricultural uh, sector, therefore, um, climate affect inflation uh, through uh, uh, food prices. So in general, uh, this is a finding of, uh, of uh, our paper. Don't if you have a question that I could take later on if you want. Great, yeah, thank you for summarizing that, Osman. I think that's, um, yeah, some, some, a really crucial distinction there between um, more short-term effects in higher income economies versus longer term effects in lower income economies and and much of that playing out through uh, food prices um also reminds me that uh, i saw this morning a headline in the uk that um food prices have have hit a record high um and i uh you know climate change must be playing a factor in that though i haven't explored that in some detail but yeah it's interesting to see food prices playing a big role um, in this phenomenon. Um, so let's move to uh, Maria for now. Um, so Maria, you've published a great deal on the impact that climate change has on financial conditions. So, uh, you know, in particular, in recent times, we've been seeing how central banks may face some trade-offs in their attempts to achieve price stability and financial stability simultaneously. Um, so how can climate change, in your, in your view, induce financial instability? And do you think that this can limit the central bank's ability to fight inflation? Yes, uh, thanks, David, for this. Uh, and thanks uh, for having me uh, with you. Um, I will uh, start uh, by answering the first part of uh, the question. And I would say that obviously uh, climate change affects uh, financial instability, and Petro had already uh, talked a little bit uh, about that. Um, I would say uh, that uh, climate change uh, can affect uh, household firms uh, and the governments, and this uh, can have implications for uh, financial instability. Uh, let me start with uh, households. I would say that the climate-related events like uh, floods uh, can destroy the property of households, and some of these households might have taken on debt. Uh, so as a result, they might not be able uh, to pay their debt, so they might have an increase in the debt default, and this might lead to a reduction in the capital of uh, the banking sector. At the same time, uh, we might have a reduction in uh, the value of the houses that can be used as a collateral, uh, which might mean that households might not be able uh, to take uh, new loans uh, from uh, the banking sector. And as we know, when uh, households have uh, less loans, this might mean uh, less economic activity and higher unemployment rate. We know that the aggregate level, when we have more unemployment rate, this might be translated to more non-performing loans. 
Uh, so this is how uh, financial climate change can affect uh, financial stability through households. As I was saying, uh, climate change can also affect firms. Um, uh, firms uh, can also find their buildings uh, being uh, destroyed. And we might also have uh, that supply chains uh, can be disrupted as well. And as a result, we might have an increase in uh, the cost uh, of raw materials. Uh, this uh, might mean that firms have less profits. Uh, there might be some uh, firms that issue bonds and uh, shares. As a result, they might not be able to pay the coupon payments and the dividends to their investors. So we we might have uh, asset price uh, deflation. Uh, there might be uh, cases which firms have taken out loans, and again, they might not be able to pay their loans, and this will have a negative effect on uh, the capital of banks. Uh, there might be cases in which uh, firms might have insurance claims, and when these insurance claims are relatively large, uh, this might induce instability uh, with uh, the uh, insurance sector. Uh, as I was saying, climate change uh, can also affect the governments. Uh, so I would say that there are countries that are uh, climate vulnerable, and I would say that uh, developing countries, um, in some cases, are more uh, climate vulnerable compared to the other ones. And um, as a result, they might experience a decline in the price of their government bonds. Uh, so this might be the case because the credit rating agencies might have downgraded them, and um, probably because investors think uh, that uh, these government bonds issued by climate vulnerable countries are more risky compared to uh, the other ones. And there is already evidence that shows that the cost of borrowing is uh, higher uh, for climate vulnerable countries. And Uli Bolz has done a lot of work on this. So uh, that's uh, the way through which climate change can affect firms, households, and governments and induce uh, financial instability. And I would say that, of course, uh, this climate-induced uh, financial instability can affect uh, the uh, central banks and their ability to fight inflation. So that's the second part of uh, your question. And I would say that this would be the case for at least two reasons. So uh, we know uh, it is highlighted a lot in some NGFS uh, reports that climate change can affect the transmission uh, channels of a monetary policy. And this is linked with the credit channel and the asset price. Uh, channel. Uh, so uh, consider, for example, that uh, you have a central bank that uh, would like uh, to uh, increase inflation. In order to do that, uh, they could potentially reduce the interest rate. However, banks might not be willing to provide loans, uh, despite the fact that the interest rate is low because they have already too many uh, climate uh, debt uh, defaults. So that's one way through which climate change can affect the ability of central banks to uh, fight inflation. And then I would say that also uh, climate-induced financial stability can create significant uh, policy dilemmas. In order to explain that, I'll give you uh, an example. So I would say that um, there is a case in which we have uh, climate change and we have this climate inflation uh, that Donata uh, explained nicely earlier. Um, and uh, at the same time, we have this increase in financial instability that I mentioned before. So in this case, from an inflation perspective, we have a central banks that might want to increase the interest rate in order to reduce a climate inflation. However, from a financial instability perspective, uh, central banks might need to reduce uh, the interest rate because uh, they would like uh, to uh, support the prices and they could also use other uh, non-conventional uh, monetary uh, tools like quantitative easing, uh, collateral framework, an extension of the collateral framework, or refinancing operations in order to support asset prices. So I would say that a climate change uh, induces, uh, includes, produces a lot of difficulties and trade-offs, uh, and it might be uh, very difficult for central banks uh, to uh, address uh, some of them. So yes, overall, uh, I would say that obviously climate change can induce financial instability, and this affects significantly uh, the ability of central banks uh, to uh, fight inflation. Thanks, David. Great, thank you, Maria. I think that's um, a great transition into our next round of contributions, where we'll discuss a bit more some of the difficulties that monetary policy can face in a world disrupted by.
climate change. Uh, we, we've taken a little bit longer than expected in, in that first round. So if we could try and shorten contributions to, to maybe two, max three minutes in this second round so that we still have some time for questions, that would be great. Um, so, so coming to back to you, Pietro, uh, so we know that central banks rely very much on their forecasts when making policy decisions. And I think you've already gotten into this to some extent, um, but could you tell us a bit more as a forecaster yourself, what difficulties you face in integrating climate change into macroeconomic models? And does climate change, in your view, hinder uh, our ability to forecast future trends um, to then inform monetary policy? Okay, thank you, David. Uh, yes, I mean, I, I start by citing you and Osman. So you mentioned previously this article uh, by the Financial Times on uh, food inflation. And in that article, they also clearly state that this is impacting differently different households. And this article also speaks to what Osman said, basically that uh, probably the effects, uh, while they are clearly uh, persistence for uh, persistent for uh, emerging economies, uh, but they are probably <laughs> becoming also more and more important for advanced uh, economies. This is just to give you an answer that. It's really complex, uh, as I tried to explain at the beginning. The effects are uh, really multifaceted uh, on inflation, but also on the economy. So, uh, quick answer: my advice is we need uh, good data and a lot of modeling frameworks and a lot of exchange of information because we, given that this is a relatively, as Donata said at the beginning, new field. There is no convergence on a common standard. Okay, when we when we think in terms of how to model and forecast, uh, and including our projection climate changes and, and all the types of shocks that are related with it. So at this stage, we are really in a, in a transition phase, and I think the most important thing is to to exchange views and to converge uh, to 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 a to a common framework. But then a more. Uh, to what I do, we do at uh, Banca d'Italia, for example, if we have to take into account uh, climate shocks, of course, we, we can do it. The answer is how, how do you do it? You do it uh, basically depends on, on which are the main transmission channels, as I tried to say. So if, if, if you think about the shocks that are affecting mainly you know, the, 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 the path of your fuel prices, or uh, financial market variables, as we said, or the policy responses enacted by governments. Well, these variables, uh, so fuel prices, financial market variables, and policy responses are so-called exogenous variables. So you can superimpose them on your model, and you can see how these changes impact, along other things, your projections. This would be the standard, let's say, way of, of doing it, OK? You can be even smarter and say, okay, but uh, suppose that we think that uh, climate change has persistent effect, as Osman said, and it affects labor productivity in the long run, medium to long run, so it affects your potential. All these models that we use at central banks usually have a short term perspective, and then they have, a, 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 of course, they converge in the long run to a neoclassical you know, growth model, essentially, where, where, the, where um, output growth is determined by factors of production and technological progress. So if you then rely on the studies which show you that uh, climate changes have an impact on productivity, you can calibrate properly also this impact in your model. Of course, then there are all kinds of different transmission channels which are more complicated. For example, the one on uh, financial market that Maria uh, was mentioning before, that this chance possibly also affect you in a non-linear way, then in, in this case, my, my, our first approach is to uh, rely also on outside models, so-called satellite models. For example, I already mentioned that heterogeneous impacts are important because households of different uh, parts of the income distribution are affected differently. So may, maybe you want to look at input-output tables, other type of models where you can basically look at the impact of, uh, for example, fossil fuel prices on different sectors in the economy, translate these different impacts 
into final uh, impact on consumption, investment, export. And then you feed these effects into your aggregated model to capture also the second round effect, the, the, the indirect impact. So, uh, of course, then, I mean, I, I could go on and tell you about different modeling approaches, and I will send you, uh, of course, what, what, what because of time, I, I, I restrict myself just to, to tell you that there are really different modeling approaches, and then depends on your data that you have and on the question that you are asking. Of course, from my point of view as a central banker, we are mostly concerned with short to medium term horizons, which are the ones relevant for monetary policy. And in this case, there are there is a, a rich, I think, uh, research on uh, semi-structural and structural modes. So to make it simpler, so dynamic, stochastic, general equilibrium models. There, there has been a lot of development in this type of models to include <coughs> an energy block, essentially. So to include into these models, both in the production and the consumption side, energy inputs, which affect uh, inputs of production and which affect also consumption and emissions. And uh, um, to, to make it short and don't take time from others, let's say uh, this is an interesting way to account for uh, climatic shocks and also uh, look at uh, what impact they can have uh, on a broad set of macroeconomic variables. Of course, these models all have their shortcomings because uh, uh, it is a, an early stage of research. But as I said, important is to, to keep working on this, exchanging information and converging them to some, to, some, um, to some frameworks that are shared and common across institutions and academia, because the important thing is then to be able to compare results when we ask the same questions uh, this day in my uh, opinion. And uh, again, this is a really a transition phase in, in the modeling of this uh, phenomena, but it's important to keep going and share information. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Pietro. Um, I think that's quite comprehensive on, on the, the modeling side for our purposes in this, in this webinar. So uh, Donata, um, from your perspective, how effective can central banks be in fighting climate-induced supply-side shocks, and what trade-offs do they face when attempting to do so? Yeah, thanks. I will try to be as uh, as short as possible. So I think that uh, when we think about, let's say, how how central banks and what a central banks should should uh, respond to uh, climate change shocks. I think it's very important to refer to the framework now that was developed by Korea a few years ago in a speech in 2018. So here he, he remember, he recall, let's say the monetary policy is the practice of identifying the nature of the shock, its persistence and, uh, and uh, its magnitude. So first starting from uh, how central banks decide on their action, they, they first look at the at the nature of a shock. So, and here we can distinguish between demand and supply shocks, as many of the other panelists have already recalled. On the one hand, demand shocks are easier to manage from a monetary policy perspective because basically they pull inflation and growth in the same direction. So there is no trade-off, let's say, for for a central bank, uh, for example, for the Fed. Uh, while uh, supply shocks are less easy to accommodate. Um, because basically inflation uh, and, and, and economic activity tend to go in a different direction. So a central bank may need to reprioritize, prioritize, let's say, prices against economic activity. And climate change related shocks typically fall in this category. So they are more difficult to manage. Now, um, Having, having in mind the nature of the shock, then a central banker needs to look at the persistence and the magnitude of these shocks. And we can move to the next slides, please. So um, if, if, the, if the shock is short-lived and it's unlikely then to affect um, inflation expectations uh, in the medium term, then uh, we say that monetary policy should look through this shock and should basically not intervene. Why? Because monetary policy tend to transmit with a lag. So if a central bank reacts to short-term uh, shocks, to short-lived shocks, let's say, it might be that uh, we'll, it would introduce some noise because basically we will see the effect of monetary policy acting when the shock would, would have already faded away. You know? On the other hand, if the shock is more persistent and we start to see some risk of the anchored on inflation expectations, which are crucial uh, in the field of central banking, 
then a central banker, banker may start to think that it's desirable to intervene. And this brings me to the third point that is the one of the magnitude. So, so far in the Euro area, we have seen limited uh, short-term impact of uh, climate-related shocks, or we have, we have interpreted climate change as, let's say, um, a slow-moving development that goes beyond the horizon of monetary policy. Um, this is called the tragedy of the horizon. No? The central bank cannot basically affect uh, long-term development. No? Uh, but yet, basically, I think one of the main outcome of the ECB strategy review is that, that we have also acknowledged that inflation and, com and climate-related financial risk are becoming more visible over time. And so Or perhaps is still the time to, to make perspective because we may see an impact on our primary money. And this brings me uh, to, um, to basically the outcome of the ECB strategy review. Um, we can go quickly just to the next slide. Um, I think uh, this basically um, is a big commitment. Uh, uh, this brought a big commitment in the field of, uh, of uh, climate change uh, um, uh, in central banking because we put forward uh, a very comprehensive action plan which uh, which uh, um, looks at commitment uh, commitments in uh, in um, incorporating climate change consideration into monetary uh, policy framework operations expanding our analytical capabilities but also um, for example statistics uh, uh, related to to climate um, and uh, here maybe just to conclude i think um, uh, in terms of what uh, we can move to the next slide uh, recently, I think last week, uh, I think on Friday, we delivered uh, on uh, on one of our commitments by uh, disclosing the carbon footprint of the Eurosystem corporate sector holdings. Um, and I think here we have uh, some good news to share. Um, so you can see uh, that the uh, weighted average carbon intensity of our portfolio decreased uh, substantially since 2018. This is plotted in, in the blue in the blue line. So let's say um, I would like then to conclude uh, with the, with this positive note that shows that uh, actions taken by, for example, by, by the ECB and the Euro system as a whole um, are now bearing their fruits. Thank you. Thank you, Donata. Very, very uh, good to end on, on a positive note there. Um, moving to Osman, um, how, how do you think, Osman, that central banks in low-income economies uh, are reacting, or how do you anticipate them reacting to climate inflation? Um, and do central banks in low-income countries face different constraints to those in higher-income uh, countries? Uh, thank you, um, um, David. Um, as we, we have shown uh, in uh, our paper, uh, unlike developed countries where the impact of climate change is not only a short term, but uh, it doesn't really uh, affect, according to our result, the output gap. Okay, and uh, uh, Donata just uh, uh, mentioned that uh, there's a trade off between uh, the output gap and the inflation gap. For developing countries, however, we have a persistent effect on inflation. Not only that, it also there's output contraction. So the central bank is actually faced with a, a dilemma here, either uh, control the output gap or control the uh, inflation, inflation gap. So if you have uh, um, a country, a central bank with a dual mandate, then uh, they'll have to choose between uh, uh, one of those two uh, 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 gaps, either reduce inflation, or increased economic activity, which is challenging, especially in the context of developing countries where uh, inflation is persistent. Um, to look at the kind of uh, uh, global picture, um, climate intervention are highly costly uh, in, in general, even when uh, there is uh, external funding and you have a uh, large upfront cost, you also have the debt uh, associated with uh, the, the donation or the funding coming from uh, uh, external uh, uh, partners. So, and developing countries are also have different priorities, okay? Climate may not be the priority at the time, but although some countries such as India, China, Korea have started to kind of uh, uh, take into account the effect of climate and try to put into place mitigating uh, uh, circumstances, 
for many developing countries, particularly those in Africa, there is a much bigger uh, uh, challenge uh, uh, for them. But the first is there are movement along uh, this line. Even the smaller countries like the Ivory Coast and Ghana are trying to implement uh, some uh, mitigating uh, a, a, a policy. The central bank uh, central banks are becoming aware of the effect of climate thanks to research done by uh, myself and colleagues here. Because this is something even uh, developed country central bank did not consider the effect of climate until very uh, recently, and uh, we are quite happy at the latest event in Glasgow. Uh, the issue was uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, mentioned there. So to sum up, developing countries, first of all, face the challenge of dealing with uh, the effect of uh, a climate change in terms of their uh, a macro macroeconomic uh, a policy framework, but also in terms of the bigger picture, they face the challenge of uh, finding a way to uh, mitigate the effect of climate change. Okay, thank you very much, Osman. So, um, Maria, you have worked quite a bit on green monetary policy proposals. If possible, in, in one to two minutes, and then we might have time for just one quick question um, after that, would you be able to talk a bit about how central banks' uh, green monetary policies might evolve in a higher inflation world? And are there particular tools that you think central banks should already be using um, to prevent? climate inflation in the future. Thanks, David. Yes, and I'll try to do that uh, within a couple of minutes. Um, I would say that there are uh, three uh, broad categories of uh, tools that central banks could use uh, in order to deal with climate change. Um, first, I would say that these tools could be used for climate mitigation. I, um, so uh, from the perspective of the second climate data, central banks have um, central banks could support the decarbonization of the economy, and as a result, they might be able to reduce climate inflation. The tools that uh, central banks can use uh, in order to contribute to climate mitigation is uh, the uh, a decarbonized uh, quantitative easing program. Uh, Donata just uh, mentioned uh, before that the ECB has recently incorporated climate-related criteria on their corporate bond uh, purchase program, and we expect that this might reduce the interest rate on government bonds and increase the interest rate for carbon intensive bonds. Uh, another tool that central banks could use uh, is uh, linked with uh, the collateral framework. So similar uh, climate related criteria could be introduced in the collateral framework, not only for corporate bonds, but also for government bonds. Uh, so uh, we could have a kind of a favorable treatment, let's say for green sovereign bonds. Uh, and this might be particularly important uh, for developing uh, countries because they are already uh, suffering from uh, climate related events and they have a relatively high cost of borrowing. So if they use uh, green sovereign bonds as a collateral um, in uh, the existing uh, collateral frameworks, this might reduce uh, the cost of uh, the projects. The third tool that I would like to mention is linked with the green refinancing operations. So we expect that um, um, central banks can uh, provide a lower interest rate uh, to banks uh, that uh, want to uh, support uh, loans in order to improve energy efficiency uh, for houses. Uh, and um, they could also increase uh, the interest rate for carbon intensive loans. So these uh, three tools could be used in order to deal with climate mitigation. I would say that also these three types of tools could be used for climate adaptation finance. Let me just give you an example. Uh, for example, uh, the, uh, there could be a reduction uh, in the haircuts uh, for uh, climate adaptation uh, bonds that are in the collateral uh, framework. Um, then I would say that uh, central banks need to act uh, because of this climate-induced financial instability that I mentioned before. Uh, and for example, we might have uh, countries like uh, Greece, uh, Spain, um, Italy experiencing wildfires, uh, droughts, and so on. So it might mean that the ECB might need to step in in order to avoid a decline in the price of government bonds. So there might be a need for a climate rescuer of uh, last uh, resort. 
And the last point that I want to make, and I think this was linked with one of the questions, is that we might need to think for fiscal monitoring and policy coordination. So yes, overall, there are various tools that central banks could be used and happy to discuss a bit later. Thank you. Great, thank you, Maria. And yeah, this was the, the question I was thinking of coming to. If um, if the panelists are okay to stay on for just maybe five more minutes, does that work? Great, because we still have uh, the majority, I think, of, of attendees in the room. So I think we'll, we'll just take one question um, from Himanshu Sharma, who, who is a sustainable fiscal policy advisor at uh, UNEP. Thank you for joining us, Hima. Um, quite a big question there. I think I'll focus on on just the latter part of it um, and maybe direct it primarily towards uh, Osman and Maria as it might be a bit of a sensitive question for, for central bankers in the room, um, uh, even though, of course, you're here in your personal capacity. But nonetheless, uh, given that tackling climate change and biodiversity de degradation is an existential issue, is there a risk that the 2% target might hamstring or, or restrict central banks and could this be a good reason for rethinking the two percent target in the medium term once the current spike has been smoothed and then secondly do we need better coordination with fiscal policy to manage the negative effects of inflation on the most vulnerable um so maybe we'll start with osman and then move to maria and if ever uh, pietro and donato want to come in on that you're you're very welcome to as well okay uh, uh, thank you Sorry, I think I may have just muted you, Osman. Okay, oh. sorry. <laughs> uh, sorry, my personal view is that uh, is always that uh, there should be uh, a coordination uh, between uh, a fiscal and a monetary uh, policy. Also, I'm not working in a, at the central bank. Uh, I'm looking at it from the lens of uh, an, an academic because, um, as I discussed earlier, if you have uh, a trade-off between inflation and output, uh, in my view, the only way to effectively address this is uh, to have this uh, coordination uh, between uh, a fiscal policy and uh, a, a monetary policy. As far as the 2% uh, target uh, is uh, a concern, um, the, 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 the issue is uh, um, central bank, in my view, need to be a bit uh, flexible given the effect of uh, the climate change. Because as we say in our paper, if you don't take into account uh, this effect, all your uh, forecasting, all the target you are, set, you, you are setting will be uh, inaccurate. So there's a need perhaps to be uh, flexible and to have a range, okay, rather than uh, a, fix, uh, a figure which uh, is the target of 2% uh, user by uh, uh, a certain uh, uh, central bank. Um, I don't know, uh, that's my view on this. I don't know if I kind of uh, missed something, but that's uh, uh, my view. Yeah, no, that, that's great. Thank you, Osman. Uh, Maria, would you like to come in on that? Yes, I'm glad to do that. And actually, I agree with what the Osman just said. Um, and of course, as an academic, I could say that, uh, yes, it might be needed to have this uh, fiscal monetary policy coordination. Uh, the way that I see it is that central banks uh, most might be able to affect the demand source, but I have in my mind that when we talk about climate change, this also creates supply shocks as well. So uh, central banks might not be able to deal with these uh, supply shocks, and we have uh, governments that might be able to do something like that to deal with the uh, supply shocks. Let's say introduce uh, price caps. So a uh, kind of uh, fiscal monetary policy coordination would make sense, and obviously this needs to be reflected on. Uh, the inflation uh, target uh, as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Maria. Any uh, final remarks before we close from uh, Donata or Pietro on this subject? Maybe, maybe, David, I can also try to to answer this question. Let's say still in my personal capacity, but of course through the lenses of the central banker, no, because that's what I do uh, every day, no. And I don't know if then maybe Pietro was wants also to add something. So personally, but again, that's in my, my personal view, I'm not sure that revising the, let's say, the demand, you know, the inflation target is, is let's say, the, the, the silver bullet, no? Uh, because, uh, of course, inflation uh, is bad 
for in general for investment and what we need now uh, i think to decarbonize our economy is to catalyze as much investment as we can to finance the green transition so when there is high inflation there is a lot of uncertainty so usually this discourage uh, investment and then of course uh, let's say revising the the targets it's a very complex process it needs to be very well justified because otherwise we risk to undermine the credibility of the central bank so we cannot let's say frequently revise our target unless this is very well justified then on uh, on fiscal monetary policy coordination i fully agree uh, with the other panelists that uh, fiscal policy coordination is key i think it's key uh, in all let's say junctures for example, in, in the past, I think, uh, let's say, monetary and fiscal coordination, if you think about the pandemic, uh, was, was very important not to bring us out of, of this economic shock. Um, and so it was important in a time, let's say, where there was a divine coincidence between the mandate of the central bank of, in a low inflation environment and, uh, let's say, the, the push not to, to the, the idea of pushing economic activity, which is always in the mind of politicians. Nowadays, where instead we see, let's say, maybe a more, a more divergence now of, uh, let's say, of, of priorities because uh, central banks are now fighting high prices, while, of course, in the mind of politicians, there is always no an attention uh, to, to, to growth. I think fiscal uh, and monetary coordination is even more important. And on this, um, for example, you know that the ECB sits in the Eurogroup, and there, and there, I think we have always called, let's say, for targeted support measures, uh, so that we can support um, people who are suffering now for the high energy shock, while at the same time uh, avoid having. Uh, strong inflationary pressure. So I think today, monetary fiscal interactions, uh, coordinations are, are more important than ever. Thanks. Thank you, Donata. Uh, any final brief remarks from you, Pietro? Okay, yeah, uh, you're muted. I'm, I'm trying to unmute you, but maybe- I do it, I, do it. I, I did it, okay, thank you. Uh, just, just to, to... So I agree with the, the, the person who made the question that burden sharing is, is really key here because these shocks are, as we saw, pervasive. And so it's important that it's not only from the monetary, but also from the fiscal perspective. Of course, there is a, a target that the central bank wants to hit, but it's uh, let's always uh, keep in mind that uh, you know deviations, uh, there can be deviations that the, the target has to be achieved over the medium. Uh, term uh, uh, policy relevant perspective. And then uh, let me just add uh, a doubt at the end. <laughs> so uh, fiscal policy can also finance green investments and, uh, and this could stimulate both uh, demand and supply. So it's not even clear to me whether you know a, a good fiscal policy will be inflationary, deflationary, no, because if you think about a good fiscal policy, this would probably uh, finance uh, R&D, technological improvements, mitigation, adaptation, all things that could play out in either direction in terms of inflation. So it could even help monetary policy in obtaining its, uh, its, its uh, target. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I think we can wrap up there. Um, so to close, I'll just say uh, a big thank you to Positive Money Europe for organizing this webinar. Uh, thank you very much to our panelists, uh, Pietro, Donata, Osman and Maria uh, for joining us and for staying on for an extra 10 minutes. Uh, much appreciated. And thank you to all of the participants, all of the audience members for joining us today and also for most of you staying on for a bit of extra time. I think it's been a really uh, stimulating discussion and great to have a range of perspectives um, on the panel. So yes, thank you all. And uh, I think we can end there and hope you all have um, a nice afternoon.